Hello and welcome to episode 15 of my sports and exercise science series. We're going to be following on from episode 14 by learning about three new topics. These include what a VO2 max test is, how a VO2 max test is conducted, and finally how high altitude training affects the body. You may have heard of the term VO2 max or VO2 max testing. Athletes can become obsessed with their VO2 max as it is the clearest indication of their aerobic fitness level and directly predicts their aerobic performance. A VO2 max test is a maximal exercise test performed on a treadmill or bike while connected to a machine capable of analysing your expired air. The test provides data on how much oxygen you use as you exercise and determines the maximal oxygen you can consume during exercise. This is the gold standard measurement of endurance. Along with VO2 max, your ventilatory threshold is also measured from your expired air. This information can be used to further analyse your fitness level. This threshold is the exercise intensity that your muscles are fatiguing from lactic acid buildup and the intensity you cannot maintain for long. Essentially, this is just above the level at which you train. With training, your ventilatory threshold will increase and get closer to your VO2 max. Other testing information useful for an athlete in training includes peak heart rate achieved during the VO2 max. There are three main benefits of VO2 max testing, and these are an accurate measurement of current fitness, the ability to design more effective training programs, and also an evaluation of the effectiveness of the training program that you've been on. The average sedentary male will achieve a VO2 max of approximately 35 to 40 milliliters per kg per minute. The average sedentary female will score a VO2 max of between 27 and 30 milliliters per kg per minute. These scores can be improved with training, but may be limited by certain factors. Among them, age plays a central role with VO2 max scores, typically peaking by age 20 and declining by nearly 30% by age 65. Gender also contributes with elite female athletes typically having higher VO2 max values than their male counterparts. However, when values are adjusted based on body size, blood volume and hemoglobin content, a man's VO2 max will generally be 20% higher than a woman's. Altitude contributes simply because there is less air to consume at higher altitudes, such as an athlete will generally have a 5% decrease in VO2 max results for every 5,000 feet gained in altitude. Higher VO2 max scores are associated with certain endurance sports, most specifically cycling, rowing, distance running and cross-country skiing. Tour de France winner Miguel Indurain's VO2 max was reported at 78 milliliters per kg per minute during the peak of his conditioning, while cross-country skier Bjorn Dali reported and achieved VO2 max of 96 milliliters per kg per minute. While high VO2 max scores can certainly contribute to one's success, particularly with endurance sports, there are other factors that arguably play a larger role, including skills training, psychological preparation, lactate threshold training, and nutrition. Now we've learned about VO2 max, let's move on to higher altitude training. The higher the altitude you reach, the more out of breath you'll find you become. If you start to run at altitude, you will find yourself becoming more tired far quicker. This is because at altitude, the air is less dense, meaning there are fewer oxygen molecules per litre of air. The percentage of air that accounts for oxygen, nitrogen and carbon dioxide is identical at sea level and at altitude, but the partial pressure of each gas is lower. This reduction in partial pressure of oxygen in the air means that it is closer to the partial pressure of oxygen that is already in the bloodstream and that less oxygen diffuses into the blood. This results in a lower saturation of haemoglobin in the blood and less oxygen being transported to the working muscles, ultimately causing a decrement in performance. The cardiovascular system must adapt to this by increasing red blood cell count. Training at high altitude is frequently used during training periods by endurance athletes to gain this adaptation, 
because when they return to sea level with the increased red blood cell count, it has a positive effect on endurance performance. For athletes that have lived at altitude during their formative years, this adaptation is fairly permanent. However, for those athletes that spend short periods of training at altitude, the adaptation reverses. Mountain climbers are at risk of developing altitude sickness, also known as mountain sickness, which may be harmful or even fatal if its onset is ignored. It is caused by gaining altitude too rapidly, which doesn't allow the body enough time to adjust to reduced oxygen and changes in air pressure. And this causes hyperbaric hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen reaching the tissues of the body. In severe cases, fluid builds up within the lungs, brain or both. At intermediate altitude, which is classed as 1,500 to 2,500 meters above sea level, altitude illness is unlikely though possible. Acute altitude sickness arises after at least four hours spent at an altitude above 2,000 meters. Ascending to heights greater than 2,500 meters can trigger a range of symptoms including headache and vomiting. Men are at greater risk of altitude sickness than women for reasons unknown. It is important to remember that being young and fit doesn't reduce your chances of getting altitude sickness. That concludes the 15th episode of my sports and exercise science series. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and don't forget to like and subscribe for more free and educational content. You've been watching UK Fitness Hub. I've been Travis Tarrant and I'll see you soon in the next episode where we begin study on the long-term adaptations to anaerobic training.